So when we talk about probability, um, we often have this notion in terms of sort of some very simple experiments, like tossing a coin, throwing a dice, for example. Um, and the way that we calculate the probability of events is we say, okay, what are all the things that could happen? So I toss a coin, it could be head or tail. I roll a die, it could be one through six. Um, and we just say that the probability of each event is just one divided by the possible number of events. Possibly reweighted, for example, if I've got a biased coin, but you know, let's assume the simple case. So this is the frequentist uh, notion of probability, and it's the one that we sort of use in terms of when we do some of these measures, we just do number of possible universes that there are. We say how many of them have this property, how many of them don't. However, one of the things that you've been advocating is taking more of what's called a Bayesian approach, mm -hmm. uh, based on starting with some notion of what a probability should be from some sort of meta theory, and then updating this based on the evidence that you receive in favor or against as you do experiments. So could you tell us how that works? Right, so yeah, this is a major bun fight within science at the moment. Uh, so uh, the history of this is that uh, well, if you could start in sort of the 30s, Ronald Fisher was a, was a major sort of f uh, figure in, in statistics um, who advocated this frequentism that, that really probabilities are, are empirical things where you, we have data and we describe them using probabilities um, or you have a sort of a, a model that generates data. And so you can say if this model were true, what would be the probability of the data that, that I have? So if, if this coin were fair, what would be the probability of 10 heads in a row? I can do those sorts of things. Um, so it, you know, that was presented to the scientific community as this is the empirical approach to probabilities. You know, we're just sticking with the data. We let the data speak for itself. Um, but uh, at the same time and rising especially recently, there's been a, a push for a broader sense of probability. Um, so one of the things you can't do with in the frequentist, uh, you know, uh, interpretation of probabilities, you can't ask, what's the probability that my theory is true? Which seems like a very basic question. If, if I say that, you know, uh, Einstein's theory about how gravity works in the solar system, I'd like to have some sort of idea about whether that's true or not, but I can't say, it, that's not a frequency. I can't go and say, you know, uh, of, of the 10,000 solar systems we've discovered, you know, 900 and you know, whatever, some fraction of them obey Einstein and the rest obey Newton, or every third Tuesday of the month, the solar system obeys Newton for a day. Or there's, there's no population, there's not even really an imagined population of which you could say the probability that general relativity is true, that Einstein's theories are, are true, is dot, dot, dot. So we'd need a broader approach. So there will always be frequencies, there will always be statistics and descriptive statistics, but if we want to do things like test theories, we're going to need something broader. So um, starting with uh, a guy called Cox in I think the 40s and 50s, and then especially in the last, say 20 or 30 years, uh, especially uh, Ed Jaynes is a, is a very important figure here uh, wrote a textbook called Probability Theory that's sort of becoming the Bible of these things. Um, what they said was, suppose uh, we've got this idea of plausibility, you know, uh, roughly that, you know, what's the plausibility that it's going to rain this afternoon? And then I can inform that with, with further details. I can look out the window and see how oh, it's a bit cloudy outside because it's England. Uh, so there's a higher, now a higher chance it's going to rain this afternoon. And if I'd seen sunshine outside, there's a lower chance. Uh, if I remember I'm in, you know, the right bit of England, then it's probably totally random whether it's going to rain this afternoon. But that again is, um, so if we think of that intuitive idea of plausibilities, and what they said, said was, okay, let's, let's suppose that they could be represented with numbers. Uh, we say things are more or less plausible, so these are things that can be compared. So, you know, with numbers we have more than or less than, so that's a good start. And then they laid down some fairly general rules about what these should obey. So if you have two, two states of knowledge that are exactly the same, should get the same plausibilities. They should sort of change in, in, in common sense ways where there's a specific assumption there, but it basically means that higher numbers are, are more plausible 
uh, and irrelevant information doesn't change anything. These sorts of assumptions, if you start with those, then it turns out that these, prob these plausibilities obey the same mathematical rules that probabilities do. That's the underlying thing for the Bayesian. So he has this, uh, he or she has this uh, broader um, idea of what we can apply probability theory to. We don't just have to apply it to uh, actual data. We can look broader. So we could apply it on the level of theories themselves. So if you have that approach to uh, probabilities, now a lot of the intuition about fine tuning, a lot of the intuition about uh, you know this this there's this number when it's it's uh, not constrained by the theory. So there's what's called a prior probability that's quite broad. That doesn't need to say you mentioned a the meta theory. I, I, it doesn't need to come from a meta theory within within Bayesian probability. It probabilities represent your state of knowledge. What, what you know. Uh, so all you, if you are totally ignorant of a parameter, then that's that's a state of knowledge that will do. That we could represent that with a with a uh, a certain uh, uh, set of you know a, a certain set of numbers, certain set of probabilities. Um, so uh, if if you have that idea of probabilities, then you can you can apply these ideas to fine tuning. There's a broad range. It could be so our prior probability is wide. But the ability to explain the data, which is called the likelihood, the probability of the data given the theory, that's very narrow. And in those circumstances, Bayes tells us, OK, so the probability of your theory now takes a hit. Now, the other thing that, that Bayes tells us is that all theory testing is really theory comparison. So that the fact that a certain, that a certain probability is low, the prob in this case it's called the likelihood, uh, doesn't mean that your theory is unlikely unless there's another theory that can come along and save the day and swoop in and explain things better than your theory without being as, as ad hoc. Um, so that's the, the sort of the, the spiel for, for Bayesian probability theories. There seem to be a lot of people worried by this because, well, it, it's sometimes called subjective probabilities. I think that's the wrong word. I think there are subjective probabilities. You could, if you wanted to, try to uh, describe the state of mind of a particular person and say, how would they react if I told them this or if they believe this or that? That's a completely separate project. That's not what the Bayesian's trying to do. We're trying to do something a bit more ob objective that, uh, that there really are the sort of connections between propositions. There is, there is really a connection between it's cloudy outside and it will rain later on today. It's not strict logical implication. It's not that this proves that, but they're not irrelevant either. This one should have some effect on, on our knowledge, not just, you know, it, it happens that a human being, if you tell them it's cloudy, will change it. But, uh, but there are, you know, a real relationship between these prop propositions that our probability should go up. Um, if you have that framework, I think you can make a lot more sense out of how we do theory testing in science in general. And you can also, I think, understand uh, you can, you can understand what you would need to know to, to say that something is fine-tuned. And as I was saying before, you know, there are some cases where I'd say a, a theory fails to test. If it, in, in the Bayesian framework, it fails to calculate probabilities. So if it, if it does that, then it's sort of untestable. You can't calculate the sorts of probabilities you'd want. So one of the really interesting things about this is it allows you to calculate things like likelihood ratios, right? Mm -hmm. To run one theory or one idea against another and say, okay, given this data, how likely is it that this theory is correct as yeah. opposed to this theory, which is the better theory that fits the data? Mm -hmm. So a classical example of this uh, comes from the really early tests of general relativity, the perihelion advance of Mercury, for example. Mm -hmm. And there were two competing theories at that point, right? Um, the, the, the first idea is that there was a planet even closer to the sun than Mercury that somehow was gravitationally pushing this around. I think it was called Vulcan, yeah. um, which is a great nod to science it's fiction sh there. It's a shame um, nothing's named that now, yeah. Anyway, carry on. Yeah, I, I think there is a planet out there someone is, there? is named Vulcan now. I should now. probably know yeah. that, I'm an astronomer. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm, I'm just a nerd, so I know <laughs> these things. Um, yeah, so there was a competition, though, between the Newtonian theory with this extra planet, what I would like to think of as the original dark matter. <laughs> you know, you put in this new extra matter to, to solve this. Mm -hmm. um, and the theory of relativity. 
Um, what is the, so if I did this calculation, the, the likelihood calculation, would this really sort of tell me GR is a better theory or would it simply say, well, you could take Newton's theory and add a planet, maybe add a moon to the planet, add a few extra factors to make it wobble the right way that would give this perihelion advance? Right, so I think this is a, quite a good case. So when, when Einstein sat down to calculate what would be the, the perihelion advance, so the, the point where the planet's furthest from the sun slightly shifts with time, um, so there are ways that it will shift in Newton's theory, but there's this leftover bit of 42 arc seconds per century that Newton couldn't quite, a Newtonian theory couldn't quite account for. Um, so you sit down in Einstein's theory and uh, you can, you know, a lot of textbooks will do this. You say, what would the perihelion advance be? And it's just, there's no, there's almost no, no there are no free parameters to play with. If you just take the, the mass of the sun, mass of uh, Mercury, distance, you know, how, how the, the speed of the orbit, it's all sort of tied down. So you've really got one chance to get this right and Einstein nails it with no free parameters. In Newtonian mechanics, in Newtonian theory of gravity, uh, you need to make an extra assumption and you need that assumption to be quite precise. There would have to be a planet in exactly the right point to give it the right perturbation you need to sort of shift the orbit in the right way. Now we've done that, we've, we've had hypotheses like that before. It's, it's basically exactly how Neptune was discovered. So uh, you, the very similar story. We were following the, the path of Uranus around the sun and it turns out that the Newtonian theory didn't quite predict it correctly. And they thought if there's another theory out there, if there's another planet out there, sorry, uh, that would explain why Uranus is moving in this way. It also predicts where we should look and lo and behold, we go and find that planet. In the Mercury case with Vulcan, it did the same thing and we went and looked and there was nothing there. And so now you not only need that specific assumption to start with, you also now have to come up with some idea for why we aren't seeing it where we think we're seeing it. And once you start adding extra assumptions in that are very specific, this is exactly the general idea of fine tuning that we, that we started with. Suspiciously precise assumptions in order to explain the data. You need a planet, it has to have this mass, it has to be in this orbit, it has to somehow be avoiding our observations. Um, all of those things are unlikely and all of those unlikelihoods tell against the theory. And then along comes general relativity, which has none of those. It just, it just hits the answer right on the, on the button. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a, a great example of uh, this sort of, of, of test of, of how a Bayesian tests and how the, the, the Bayesian approach sort of reproduces what we get from from, from our intuition that, hey, here's a correct prediction that must be general relativity. Right, so I mean, I think this is very interesting in that it does sort of, it goes both ways, right? So in one case, you have the prediction extra planet, yeah. you know, Vulcan's not there. In the other case, you have the prediction an extra planet, it is there. Right. And sort of in both cases, you'd have said this was, a, this was an issue of fine tuning before you'd seen either planets. You know, right. you need precisely this planet, it needs to be in this orbit, it needs to be doing X, Y, and Z. And right. You go out and you test the theory just by making an observation. Mm -hmm. Now we find ourselves in a similar position with general relativity now when we look at galactic rotation, right? This is where we need to introduce a very similar idea of dark matter mm -hmm. to get the rotation curves correct. And so, given that we have not directly detected dark matter in any way, how big of a count against Einstein's theory should this be for a Bayesian? Well, the question is whether there's, again, all, all theory testing is really theory comparison. So we have a data, which is how stars move around the galaxy. We have, uh, in their orbits, we have the theory, which is Einstein, Newton theory basically works in this regime anyway. So we can sort of look at how much mass there is and we find that this, the you know, galaxies should not be bound. There's not enough mass there to hold the whole thing together. Um, uh, so we say that there is this stuff out there called dark, dark matter, uh, which 
The dark just means it's, it's not currently doing anything that we could detect with our telescopes. Um, so if, I don't see a really super fine tuned assumption here. So if, in the case of Vulcan, we needed it to be exactly here and doing exactly this. But in a cosmological context, if you stick dark matter into your universe at the beginning and then run, say, a cosmological simulation forwards and you see galaxies form, the dark matter will end up roughly where it needs to be to do what it needs to do with some fairly uh, generic assumptions about dark matter. So one of the important things is how much does a single particle of dark matter weigh? And we don't need to make a really precise assumption that it just needs to be heavier than a certain level so that it doesn't move very fast. So there's sort of thermal motions left over from the early universe that will we'll, we'll have things moving around. If you had a very light particle, it would move a lot, it would escape from galaxies, just like light, it would just stream out. But if you have a heavy particle, that's fine, it'll stay there and it'll explain galaxy rotation curves, as they're called, perfectly fine. But you don't need a, a super precise number there. So I, I don't see a, a massive fine tuning issue. But on the other hand, we, we, you have to assume that it's there and you have to assume something about it. So if there was an alternative theory which could do away with dark and dark matter altogether, then that would be that would be that would really be something. That would you know it would, it would have to explain all the things that dark matter explains. Dark matter also explains certain things about the leftover light from the early universe. Um, but if it could do that without having to suppose that there is this other thing out there that we've never seen, it's just an, a, you know it doesn't have to make an extra assumption. It would sort of win the Bayesian war. Now there, there is a, well, there are, there are a couple of ideas. There, the main sort of alternative to dark uh, matter is something called MOND, Modified Newtonian uh, Dynamics, um, which basically says that in certain regimes when things are moving very uh, slowly or very, very small accelerations in the, in the sort of original version of the theory, that Newtonian's laws break, uh, need to be changed. Um, and this supposedly, well, it, 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 it accounts for the, the way that, that galaxies go around, but you don't need to suppose an extra type of thing. But you still got extra assumptions there. So it's not obvious that it's winning on the, in the Bayesian wars because it doesn't suppose an extra type of thing, but it does suppose a change in the laws of nature as we know them, which looks sort of ad hoc. So, and especially once once we tried to write down versions of these theories that were consistent with what we know about relativity, what we know about Einstein's theory, uh, all of those sorts of things, those look rather ugly. There's all sorts of assumptions you need to make in order to have it uh, fit the data. So in that sort of Bayesian shootout between those theories, um, dark matter is such an interesting problem because there's, there's no simple theory that, that can sort of nail all the predictions we need. We either need a new type of stuff, which is the favoured one, or we need the universe to behave differently to how we think it behaves, but we have to make assumptions in both of those. So we're, again, the, the, we're being pointed on to a new theory. We're just not quite sure what it is. So this sort of comes at the, the other end of modifying Newton for what you would do to get gravitational uh, corrections in the relativistic regime. Um, so you could do a post-Newtonian expansion of GR, for example, and find you know, a set of terms um, that would each come with some factor. There's a 1 over R squared term, there's 1 yeah. over R cubed term, etc., etc., etc. And each of these would come with some free parameter. So by your sort of analysis, each of these parameters would come with a cost at um, comparing yeah. this with Newtonian mechanics. Yes. So this is where there's an interesting intersection between the Bayesian approach and what's called Occam's razor, which is basically, well, depends how you formulate it. Um, don't, don't make more assumptions than you need, uh, is the way you, you might want to say it. Um, and how you do that within a Bayesian approach, but fine tuning sort of automatically penalizes any extra parameters because you have to take into the account into account the probability that that parameter would have the value you need to explain the data. And so adding an extra parameter almost automatically gets penalized. But again, it, 
unless there's another theory coming along which doesn't have that problem and so can can beat out this theory it doesn't mean that that your theory with you know this doesn't mean that that dark matter doesn't exist that there's you know it's it's a it's a reason to be suspicious that maybe there's this wonderful unified theory underneath it all like what what uh, einstein did for mercury um that would be great we should totally go and look for that um, but it might just turn out that yeah dark matter does exist it might be like uh neptune we just need to go out and find it